All right, so first off, I've just got a, my work set up here right now. So I've got all sorts of things. I have beverages to stay hydrated. I have my water that I'm gonna need. I have all of my brushes. I have my pens and pencils out here because they just live out here. Um, I have pencil sharpener, of course. And then I have a whole bunch of things over here. And I'm gonna show you how I set them up and what they are, okay? So here we go. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, you need only a couple of things to do watercolor. At least it seems that way in my head. Uh, I'm sure that it's actually more things than I actually think that it is. Um, good pencil is always nice. If all you have is just like a 2HB regular Ticonderoga yellow school pencil, that will work. Uh, these are Blick Studio pencils. Um, one's a 2B, one's an H. They're kind of in the middle. Um, and I'll talk more about uh, graphite breakdown and the HB scale as we go along. But you don't want a pencil that's too hard or too soft. You want it to be right in the middle and 2B or H or an HB, any of those will work. So we want to have a pencil available. Um, my beginning students always get this little palette and it's just got 12 little wells, right? Is it 10 or 12? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 wells. 12 would be nicer, but that's okay. We're going to make a 12-step color wheel. So if there were 12 wheels, that would be great. Um, I am outside, so I'm going to get some wind, uh, which is fine. Uh, this is nice as just a really cheap little palette. Um, this is about $3. I've seen them up to 6 when you buy the lid as well, but it's not a big deal, um, pretty low key purchase, but these hold quite a bit of water so you can make really different levels of um, value with the same color. So if you're looking for a watercolor palette, you want something that has a flat surface and it needs to either be plastic or porcelain. I've seen people use metal palettes before, uh, but you don't want it to be absorbing the water away from you. You know, you want the water to sit on top of it. Um, porcelain egg containers, right, that are like, that hold eggs on your countertop are really beautiful palettes. I've seen people use um, like their muffin tin, right? <laughs> <laughs> in a pinch. I do like to have something that's nice and white, right? So that um, you can see the colors that you're mixing. Um, and then something with a lid is even better because then you can leave your palette just how it is. I can show you my crazy palette that I use on a regular basis. This is a pretty big palette. Um, and it's got a whole mess of paints in it. It is set up basically warm to cool. Um, I don't ever clean it. You can see that because there's like little flowers and seeds in here and here's a dead spider. Um, that's probably not the best practice, but I, I don't clean my palette because I love using all of this as the starting place for my next colors. So this is what my uh, palette looks like on a daily basis. I do see people who clean their palette all the time and keep everything in working order and have all of their paints labeled and um, that is a better way to work. So if that sounds great to you, that's exactly how you should get started, um, especially if you're going to buy wet watercolors. This is um, a mess of tube watercolors that are from Windsor & Newton, um, they're from Utrecht, they're from Daniel Smith, I have some Holbeins in there. I just have a real um, menagerie of paints that I've purchased. Mostly because as an instructor, I sometimes purchase a color to try it out to uh, know what's out there on the market. So this is what my palette looks like. And if you have palette questions, please ask me. And um, we can look at different kinds of palettes and palette solutions. And then these are the different types of watercolor that I have used in my practice. So. I started teaching high school um, and I started teaching watercolor in high school as the easiest way to discuss color theory, which is what we're going to be discussing today through the color wheel. 
And this little set is the best little set that you can buy for a bunch of kids. It's like a scholastic grade set and it comes in a stack. It's made by the company Koinoor, K-O-H-I-N-O-O-R. Um, they are also owned by Alpha Color. I don't know which who owns who, so Alpha Color and Koinoor are the same company if you're familiar with them. And what's neat is it stacks up so that you have these sort of families of color. And it's something I've always really liked. These are called cakes. These are dry watercolors and you get the primary colors with a true black and a brown and a white here. I don't touch my white. I pretend that white watercolor does not exist. Um, watercolor is basically created through gum arabic being a binder with um, straight pigments and then whites uh, especially white watercolors tend to actually be white gouaches or opaque watercolors that have chalk mixed in with them and um, I don't love the combination of the gouache and the watercolor. Gouache is super opaque and it's like the heavier bodied cousin of watercolor. It originated in like poster and cell painting for animation and so it has really great coverage and the thing that I really like about watercolor is its transparency and luminescence um, and I like to get all of my whites through the white of the paper that's really important to me and I lighten all of my colors using water which you will see me do here in just a second then you have these sort of like cool and warm family colors and you have these blues grays and browns together greens and um, a nice lemon yellow that's like really really cold versus this more like cadmium or true lemon um, or medium lemon hue here I'm sorry yellow hue here and then these reds are really interesting because they're cold and warm on the same palette and you get this pretty crazy orange which mine's dirty right now but when you use this orange it is almost neon which can come in handy especially when mixing to uh, tone down your blues these two premixed ochres these yellow ochres this really light one that i'm assuming was made with this lemon yellow and a little bit of violet and this warmer one that seems like it was made more with this yellow and a little bit of violet and the other interesting thing is there's no violet on this palette and um usually when my students start i only let them touch this beginning primary palette because then they have to mix all of their own colors as they move around the color wheel and that makes for better color mixers because these are the only three colors you need. Um, I do use black in my practice but you can use these in combination with one another in order to make really dark darks and these three colors make all the colors in the world and then we use our water to lighten and our saturation and dilution. Um, to darken and lighten as far as values go. So this is a great little set and what's really fun is this is like a perfect set for throwing in a backpack or a purse or just any type of travel bag if you love working outside. Windsor & Newton makes a Cotman travel set that is absolutely amazing but it's a pretty penny. Um, I think that I've seen them as cheap as $120 but they don't go much less than that. Um, and this is like a little traveling palette and if you set it over white paper it makes for a really good opaque surface even though this is a transparent little clear cover. But this is all you need, right? You just need some paints and a little palette in order to mix. This is another type of watercolor that I have been interested in. These are the Yarka sets and these are what are called semi-moist. Um, I like these because they're right in the middle and they have really saturated pigments. Um, so you get a really good arrangement in this eight set here. So you have like a true yellow that's right in the middle, a really warm, beautiful orange. This lovely red that um, I will show you is like not cold and not super warm. So you can use it to mix both oranges and violets. And those medium reds that are right in the middle that aren't too warm and aren't too cold, whew, they are hard to come by. So I've really enjoyed having this red and this orange. They've been um, really interesting to work with. This is a really deep, lovely brown that kind of leans towards being more sepia. This is a true black that leans very cold. It's got a ton of blue in it. Um, it almost reads as like a Payne's gray or an indigo at some time. 
And then you have um, this really good violet, this blue, and this really like middle of the line green as well. These red and green combos are so interesting in regards to just like where they sit in the middle, that they're not necessarily more warm or more cold. Um, they're really like neutral in their temperature, which makes them really good mixing. This is a really good mixing set. And um, because this is semi-moist, it's gonna give you far more saturation with your pigment with less water because it's already kind of in the middle. Um, so it's not wet and it's not dry. It's right there in the middle. And that's from a company called Yarka. And I've used a lot of stuff from Yarka before. Mm, they just make a really good, like, middle of the line. Maybe that's just what their deal is. <laughs> they do really good middle of the line. It's not cheap and it's not expensive and it's, um, it's really nice and consistent to work with. Although that little brush is trash, so don't use that little brush. Um, here's another Yarka wet set that I just had in my box. Um, if you want to spend a small amount on a tube set, you can see I've taped this guy up because he's really traveled with me quite a bit. Um, and these are just nice little wet watercolors. So this is a tube set here. I didn't bring my super good ones out right now. Um, but something I really love about this as a mixing set are these duos. So this is how my brain thinks a lot of the time about color. Like not even looking at this down the line, but just those primaries. Like having a lemon yellow and a medium yellow, a scarlet and a crimson, a cerulean and an ultramarine means that you have a cold and a warm of each color. And if you have a warm yellow and a cool yellow, and a warm red and a cool red, and a warm blue and a cool blue, you can make all of the colors in the world and that's really all you need is this right here and then if you want to throw in something right like an ivory black or a raw umber to really push your darks um, then you can build your darks up that way but you can also build up your values through layering right we can put really saturated violets over really saturated blues and make some really wonderful darks and we can make our oranges over here using our warm red and our either yellow right and mix that in with our blue and get some really deep browns in there as well we can get to this burnt sienna and yellow ochre no problem just mixing this right here so if you're gonna buy a set you know this is what I would look for is there something that's cold and something that's warm something that's cold and something that's warm, something that's cold and something that's warm within your primaries because those are your most important colors. They're really your only colors, right? And then all of this is like, it's like frosting and sprinkles. It's just extra and it helps you uh, make better work as you go down the line, but it's not needed. It's not a necessity, okay? Um, wet watercolors that come in the tube never come with their own mixing surface, really. Um, so you're gonna have to invest in a palette that way. And then this is an Angora, an Angora set. They, these are opaque colors. Um, these are also cakes. This is an amazing quality. These are German-made Angora watercolors. The set has never been touched and I'm not going to touch it. Um, I believe that it might belong to another one of my students out of their budget. I'm gonna check with them, but I had it in my tools, so I thought I would show it to you because look at all this variation in these colors. And you can buy a really cheap version of this at like a Michael's craft store that is often like $5, um, which is what I give my daughters, which is what I give any sort of beginner that just wants to try stuff out and doesn't wanna spend a lot of money. And you know, this set is more like $25 to $35 depending on where you're buying it. But look at all these amazing colors. Look at all these greens and blues that you already, there's like nine blues here. And there's so many amazing greens. And look at this little violet pink set in here. You've got some really good pinks and violets in there that sometimes can be hard to come by. Um, which is why in my own wet watercolors, I also purchase opera pink, which is more of like a neon pink. So you'll see what works for you and what you think is missing from your set. But um, just remember that all watercolors started out as wet watercolors and that they're just in different states of dryness and that your tube watercolors will dry as well. Um, so don't think that like using the dry cakes 
are, is somehow less than using the wet watercolors. You know, I want, I want you to just sort of try whatever's in your price range and whatever you're interested in trying and see what you like because not everybody's gonna like the same thing. And then you're gonna need a couple of other things. So this is what we're making today. Um, this is a really big one. This is like an 11 by 15 sheet of paper. I'm gonna work a little bit smaller than this and we're just gonna focus on our color wheel. I think I've made about 400 color wheels, but uh, we're gonna be looking at our primaries, so our red, yellow, and blue, and then we're gonna be making three steps of value variation, so a light, a true hue, and a dark, so that you get tints and shades of each hue. So this is your true hue, this is your true hue in this kind of like middle donut, and then we're gonna make a step outward that's gonna be mostly water and a little tiny bit of pigment, extremely diluted, and then we're gonna make a slightly more saturated, slightly less water, a little bit more pigment, and then I use the tiniest bit of black just to make what's called a shade of your true hue. So true hue uh, in the middle, that's just the color by itself. And then out here, I'm gonna make a tint of the color using water and just a small amount of the pigment. And then internally, I'm gonna make what's called a shade, right? And just take a little bit of black and mix it in with um, our watercolor here. And there's a real, um, mistrust of black watercolor and that's because the original black watercolors were made with lead and over time they turned white and so there's been this sort of um, anti-black watercolor for belief system for years and years and years and years but now our mixing capabilities and chemical abilities to make colors and pigments is um, so refined and, and so strong that we make beautiful black watercolor now if you would like to use it to your advantage. Okay, so I'm gonna set this aside for a second. And then um, I just brought a couple of other ones here. I keep these laminated ones for my students to work on, especially when we're outside. And if you laminate your uh, watercolor wheel, then you'll always have your paints, right? And what their capacity is here. And you'll also have it so that if you spill anything on it, you can just wipe it off, which is, is good to have. This is a store-bought color wheel. One of the things I don't like about a store-bought color wheel is that it's always printed right um, in opaque colors. So this red and violet combo, you know, looks very different on a color wheel that's basically printed in screen print ink um, or CMYK, you know, color ink, but if you are new to color theory, this is a great, great learning tool, right? So um, you get to see different types of color schemes that work well to each other. You always get to see the complementary color and the split complementary color. And so you can see the setup and the relationship of the colors to one another. So if you've never ever spent a day mixing colors on your own, this is sometimes a good purchase. Um, these are usually like two to five dollars depending on where you're at. This is basically what we're gonna make today. This is a nice little sheet of paper. Um, we're gonna set up here our color wheel and then I'm gonna sh leave space for this because on my next video I'll just add it in to the bottom. Um, this one is on uh, cold press but it doesn't look like it's in arches and there's a different um, texture on the back of this paper than on the front of this paper. So I'm 95% sure that this is my Canson paper that I buy just for doing tutorials um, and in-class work, which is not 100% cotton. So when you start to buy paper, the more cotton there is in your paper, the more expensive your paper will be, but it will also create the best watercolor for you. Um, so if you're willing to spend money on anything, spend money on paper. And that brings us to this right here. So this is uh, the leftovers, just, just the empty shell of what is the Arches Cold Press Pack. Um, this is 12 sheets of nine by 12 inch paper. 
it's just the perfect size for learning. It's 140 pound, which is a step under what I normally work on. I normally work on 300 pound. But when you're doing your color wheel and your complementary color schemes and you're working out values and spheres and you're just learning about how to manipulate your medium, then there's no reason that you should be spending a bunch of money on a 300 pound paper um, just to put a color wheel on it. <laughs> now, if a year goes by and you spend a ton of money on good paints, like you buy yourself a full landscape mixing set for $200 and you buy yourself a nice palette that also costs you about $40 and then you want to buy yourself a really good block of 300 pound watercolor paper that's from Arches, that's 100% cotton, that's just like it's a it's a good it's a pretty penny right like somebody maybe gives you a $500 gift card to your favorite art supply store and you're like thank you um, and once you've made that financial investment you should make a color wheel with your actual good paints that you use just so that you know what they're capable of because if you don't know what your paints can do then you are selling yourself short because you can manipulate your paints in ways that you might forget about and it's these sort of beginning learning things that can be so so helpful so today here at the house what i have is some hot pressed paper so um the difference between hot pressed and cold pressed is that the hot press does not have really any texture so you see here this cold press right you're going to get this really beautiful undulation of the paper it basically means that when the paper came out of the uh, pulp bath and into its form that it got pressed with cold pressure whereas here on your hot press it got pressed with hot Right? So they're going to heat up the metal plates that are pressing down the paper. And this, it's just like an iron, right? You heat up your iron to get rid of your wrinkles. And that's how hot press paper works. Is that there's basically no texture in this paper. And you'll see it when I lay it down. And if you love to draw on watercolor or you think that maybe you're making this jump between your drawing practice and your watercolor practice maybe you have always been a drawer and you love to draw in pencil and pen this might be the paper for you because it loves mixed media so I'm gonna tape down because we're gonna add water to this paper and we don't want it buckling we don't add very much water when it comes to our color wheel we won't really be like soaking our paper but I still want to tape down because I'm sitting outside and there's wind and it's good practice to always tape your paper down um, because it's going to keep this nice consistent texture to your paper. And I'm just using like painter's masking tape from Home Depot, but you can use any type of masking tape or artist tape and there's special paper tapes that are made for stretching and taping down your watercolor paper but basically you just want to be like at least a quarter inch on can you see how far i am on there right there um and if you love being like perfect perfect then um you can measure in like a quarter of an inch or if you love half inch borders you can go ahead and tape off half inch borders and basically the trick with the tape is you pull it the length that you need it and then you pick it up on either end and you place that down with your thumbs on top and I'm pulling it kind of top I'm there's no pressure in here right I'm not pulling I'm just barely like pulling it at the edges and then pushing my thumbs down and what am I taping on to I am taping on to a little like dry erase <laughs> masonite board um, that I just buy uh, you know in four by eight sheets at Home Depot and then I have them cut down and this one is uh, it looks like it's 12 by 18 so uh, I'm just gonna put that there maybe you don't have a board at home you don't have a drawing board or something you just tape down right onto your table um, and there, there should be no issue with that especially if uh, you're the only one who uses your table then please be my guest okay so you need a circle maybe you have a bowl maybe you have a little palette like this 
and you're just gonna set it down and it turns out I'm just gonna do this right in the middle because I'm working horizontally so I'm just gonna trace around the outside with a pencil and for some people this is their least favorite part of the assignment <laughs> um, and I always have students who are like you didn't say there was gonna be math and there's just this little tiny bit and it doesn't have to be perfect so um, I'm just gonna trace around my tape you could pick three um, bowls or you could pick uh, a cup right and a bowl look I've got another circle here that will work perfectly um, if you have an empty cup I have a set of Dixie cups where you know if you trace the top it's a nice big circle for the middle circle and if you trace the bottom it's this nice tiny circle for the middle um, and then we're gonna split this circle these three circles in half to begin with so you are going to need a ruler or a straight edge so if you don't have a ruler at home you can just use another sheet of paper especially if you have watercolor paper you can use another piece of watercolor paper or you can use the back of the pad that you bought your watercolor paper in and you're going to split that in half and then you're going to split those halves and halves again so that you have quarters and our goal is to have 12, and so then this is where people usually mess up. Um, we're gonna split our quarters into thirds. So, let's see here. I am getting a weird little bit of white here, so I hope you can see this. So I'm gonna just eyeball it and say that's a third, and this is a third, and that's a third, and this is a third. And I just sort of make these guesses about where a third is all the way around. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your ruler and you're gonna set this one down so that it comes in contact with that one and goes through the center, okay? And then you're just gonna lightly drag your pencil across. And then you're gonna turn and do the next one. And you wanna be through the center so if your lines don't quite match up, I feel like it's more important to have that sort of like center met. So there we do that. And then if you are not recording a video, it would be really easy to turn your paper right now so that you're not... Oh, look at what I said. It's important to go through the center and then I didn't do it. And look at me not caring because it does not need to be perfect. Um, do not spend more time on this than you need to and you'll note that I didn't bring an eraser so I'm not changing that. Okay. Let's count them to make sure that we have 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Perfect, right? We're basically making a color clock. I always start with red. I start with red in my number one position because red out of the primaries is just about 50%. So if you imagine a photograph in which you remove the color and you're looking at this color wheel as black and white, this red right here is gonna be really close to a 50% gray. Whereas this yellow over here is gonna be really close to a 25% gray. And this blue is gonna be really close to a 75% gray. And because of that, I stay with my red right in the middle because I think that it's really important to have this sort of not weak and not strong starting place. So I'm gonna start with my red, and again, I'm gonna put my true hue in the middle. I'm gonna come out and do this outer edge second, and that's gonna have what's called a tint. And usually that's a color mixed with white, but in this case, it's a color mixed with water in order to make it lighter. So this is a lighter version of your true hue. And I'll just write hue here. And then in this pie piece right here, I'm gonna add black. So that's gonna be my color, my true hue, my red, plus a little bit of black to create what's called a shade. So we'll have this mid-tone, a light, and a dark. And so that's our most basic of value transitions or value scales, right? So that we have something in the middle, something that's lighter, and something that's darker. And I work within those three ranges quite a bit so I think this is a great place to start after we have our primaries we have our secondaries so let's come around to number five and label that yellow 
And then if you want to make a little note that that's about a 25% gray on a black and white scale, scale you can. Um, if I mix a primary and a primary together, I get a secondary, which this one is orange. And then in between my primaries and secondaries, I have these half steps, right, which are called intermediate or tertiary colors. So in between red and orange, I have red orange. And it's exactly what it sounds like. And we always list our primary first. And then in between a secondary and a primary over here, I have yellow orange. And again, I'm putting my primary first and then my secondary. And I'm coming around the edge here. So I know that my next secondary here is gonna be green. So I'm gonna go yellow, yellow, green which is like a bit of a chartreuse color. Then seven, I have green. This is the first time that I can check my complements to make sure that my colors are in order. So red and green are complementary colors. They are directly across from each other on the color wheel. You can see them here. Boom, boom. One to seven, right? So halfway across, six steps on our 12-step color wheel, I see that I have my green. Now what is a complement, right? Red's complement is green, and it is across from its, its you know, friend on the color wheel because it is the mix of the other two primaries. <laughs> so, as we come around here, I've got green, green, blue, green, blue, boo, blue, green. We always put that primary first, right? This is almost like a teal or a turquoise. Then number nine is gonna be blue, right? That's another primary, that's about a 75%. Um, gray scale there and then from blue we move into our violet so then we have number 10 is blue violet and then number 11 is violet and number 12 is red violet so we have our three primary colors red yellow and blue then we have our secondary colors here I've got green and orange and violet. If you grew up saying purple, please continue saying purple. Um, it seems to be just sort of like a hierarchy and then also maybe just like a location-based language switch there. Um, I just had a teacher that always demanded that we say violet, so I always say violet. And then in between we have our tertiary or intermediate steps. So we have red, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, green, blue, green, blue, violet, and red, violet. And you'll have people that have names for these colors as well. Like you may hear people call red, violet, burgundy, right? You may hear people call red, orange, like I've heard people call it like a clementine before. Um, this is where you get into this really like beautiful like cadmium kind of red, a really warm red. Um, chartreuse is really like chartreuse and lime are very close to yellow, green, teal, and turquoise. Blue violet should always look like a really wonderful blueberry <laughs> um, while you're working on it. And let's see here if I can get rid of just this little bit of I see it's super high. Okay, I'm not sure that's gonna work then, but we'll try. Let's see if that's gonna work. Is that gonna block out whatever's making this? No, it must move more on this side. You guys are like, what is she talking about? But I have this little bit of like light that's coming through. Hmm. Interesting, my hand's blocking most of that. Okay, well, we'll see. I think that that's not better at all. Okay, that's funny. Maybe coming this way. This is like one of the disadvantages of working outside. Oh well. We're not gonna quite get it, are we? No. I'm wondering how I can block it from up here. 
Oh well, of course it's right in the space that I'm working. Okay, hold on. <laughs>